Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Today I am super excited because I get to announce that my brand new book, The Final Table, is now available. And not only that, I actually have a copy right here to show you. The Final Table by me, Gareth James, forward by Phil Helmuth. Play your best poker when the most is at stake. I've included everything I know about final table strategy in this book, including over 100 hand examples from eight and nine handed through to short handed and even heads up play as well. So today I thought I would give you a sneak peek into the book and show you what it's all about. Let's do that now. All right, so here we go then. This is the ebook version that you can see on screen right now, as you've already seen as well there is a paperback version. There are 336 pages in this book. You can have a quick look, it's a pretty thick book. I think it's gonna keep you going for a nice long time. Let's have a quick look then, a sneak peek into the new book. As you can see, play your best poker when the most is at stake. And here we go then, we've got the contents page. So it starts off with some acknowledgements, forward by Mr. Phil Helmuth. Really excited that we got Phil to do that forward. And then an introduction to the book where I talk about how to get the most out of the content in the book. And then you can see there are seven rough chapters. We talk about what is ICM, an introduction to ICM flop strategy. And then there are lots of hand examples. I mentioned before over 100 hand examples split into eight to 10 players remaining, five to seven players remaining, three to four players remaining, heads up play. And then I've included this chapter right at the end on how to make continuous improvement. So you know how to study the complexities of final table strategy. So a really common theme that goes throughout this book is understanding bubble factors and risk premiums and what kind of effect that has on our strategy. So what I thought I'd do is give you an example from the beginning of the book. You can see the first chapter, what is ICM, where I compare big blind defense strategies for chip EV and for ICM. So the example that I use is the button opens off 50 bigs, the small blind has 15 bigs and the big blind has 30 big blinds. Now with the small blind being the short stack and big blind being the medium stack in this example, the big blind has a bigger risk premium against the button than the small blind does. So when their risk premium is higher, that's gonna affect their strategy. Not only that, it's also gonna affect the button strategy and the small blind strategy as well. So in this three-handed example, I take a look at the folding, calling, three-bedding and jamming frequencies for the big blind facing the button open. And as you can see, uh, in Chippy V, we are only folding 16.4%, we're calling 66, we're three-bedding 10.3 and we're jamming 7.2. In the ICM example, with a much bigger risk premium, we are folding a lot more frequently. So you can see we're folding 52.8%, we're calling 36.6, three betting 5.6, so not three betting as much, and we're not jamming as much either, only 5.1%. So I've included the risk premiums here, and you can see in the bottom left corner, we've got big blind versus button. The risk premium here is 12.2%. So what this means is the big blind needs to be able to realize an extra 12.2% in this spot. And that's what's causing the big blind to fold a lot more frequently. So here you can see the two side-by-side -side strategies for big blind defense against a button open for chip EV on the left and for the ICM or dollar EV example on the right. And as you can see, we're folding a lot more frequently as we saw earlier on. But you can also see how the strategy changes. So for example, for chip EV, nines is mixing between three bedding and jamming. Whereas in the ICM example on this final table, nines is mainly calling, but there is also a little bit of three bet jamming as well. So the strategies completely change. And so when you can see the strategies side by side, you can really visualize the differences between chip EV and ICM. So next I just wanted to give you an idea of how the hands are laid out in the book. As I mentioned before, over 100 hand examples. You can see you've got position and stack size here. We've got the buy-in and we've got the payouts remaining in the top left as well. So as we work through here, you can see there's a title, medium stack button versus big stack, big blind. And if we take a 
you know, a scroll down here, you can see I include bubble factors and risk premiums. I think I mentioned that before. And then we've got different strategies. So you can see the, on the left-hand side, button first in strategy for chip EV, and then button first in strategy for dollar EV. So if we scroll up a little bit back to the risk premiums, you can see this is what's going to help explain why the button only gets to open 22-ish percent now. So the button is opening into the big stack in the big blind, and there's a 10 big blind stack there as well. So if we take a look at the risk premium the uh, of the button against the big blind is 20 percent. So if you think about it, if you open 40, 45 percent of hands from the button in this spot and the big blind three bets, you're not going to be able to defend enough hands because you need to factor in that extra 20% equity uh, that you need to realize in this spot. So if you open 40, 45% of hands, there just aren't enough hands in that range then to be able to continue that have enough equity, even if we knew that the big blind was three betting some really garbage hands as well, because they are going to include and they are going to three bet some strong hands as well. Not only that, they can actually three bet jam and put us at risk in that way as well. So we have to tighten up our range. So what I've done in the book is to highlight where there are some really big risk premiums and show you what kind of effect that has on everybody's strategy. So it's not just a case of looking at, okay, the button can't open as wide in this spot. We also see, okay, but what does the big blind get to do in this situation and things like that. In this introduction to ICM flop strategy section, what I do is have the shorter of the two stacks on the button for the first example in the big stack in the big blind and then I switch them over so the button is now the big stack and the big blind is the player in second. And so what this should show you is again the effect of risk premiums and the positions on the strategies for opening and defending the big blind as well. So this book is all about final table strategy as you know the name of the book is the final table but I wanted to find a way of working in some bubble strategy to be able to explain the difference between uh, bubbles and what happens when everyone's already in the money on a final table. Now, if you play on some of the smaller sites or you play smaller fields live, then there could be a situation where you arrive on the final table, but you're not yet in the money. So I started the book with some of those examples. So we've got eight to 10 players left, but not yet in the money. And then it goes to eight to 10 players left, but you're already in the money. And you might have been in the money for a very long time. So I wanted to include this example. I think it's pretty interesting. It says here, in the next hand, it folds to the hijack. And you can see he's got 67 big blinds. He's the chip leader who pauses for a moment when the action is on them. This gives us some time to think what we're gonna do if they raise. We're in the small blind with ace jack off. If they do open, what should we do? And there's some options there, fold, call, or three bet jam. Now we can have a quick look here and it says, as the chip leader, the hijack should be opening very wide from this spot, covering everyone still left to act. Their range should be as wide as 39, 40%. And while our risk premium against them is 15.9% and theirs against us is just 2.8%, it is important, as you can see here, that I've written not to shy away from spots like this. So this is the hijack opening range from the solver. And against that, this is our three bet jamming range. You can see it's the most profitable play here. We don't want to make the mistake of just calling. There's a tiny bit of calling. You can see that in some hands. But as you can see, we don't want to make the mistake of just calling and seeing what happens post flop. We've got to look for opportunities to play aggressively against the chip leader. So this is an example of a situation that's going to set you apart from your opponents who maybe are playing too tight in these spots. You know, maybe they're scared to fight against the chip leader, but you're not scared because you know what is correct. You know what's plus EV and you are going to take these spots. If they're playing too tight, they're going to miss opportunities. The hijack, as you saw, is opening 39% of hands. When you jam, there aren't many of those 39% of hands that can call in this spot. So the next hand in the book, it says here facing an open from a medium stack cutoff as a short stack. And what actually happens in this book after some deliberation the hijack folds and it's actually the cutoff that opens for a min raise the button folds what do we do with ace jack off now so this is a completely different situation the cutoff is not the chip leader so i go on and explain this despite being in later position the cutoff should be opening a much tighter range than the hijack the cutoff is covered by both the button and the big blind so this is a much different situation from if the hijack had opened so the cutoff actually only gets to open about 17% of hands here, which is a really tight range from the cutoff. You think about chip EV ranges, 17% is very, very tight compared to say 30, 35, even 40% of hands that you could open from the cutoff. 
So this is what the cutoffs range looks like instead. You can see it's a lot tighter than the hijacks range. And so what happens now is our strategy against this needs to change. So the reason why I put these hands together was to show you how it's important that your strategy changes based on who opens. And it's not just a case of going, oh, well, they open from a later position, so they're probably wider. That's not the case in this spot and in a lot of situations on final tables. The chip leader gets to open a lot more frequently because they cover everybody and everyone else's risk premium against them is so much higher. But when you are then covered by players behind you, suddenly you're going to have to play a lot tighter. So our strategy facing the cutoffs open is a function of their opening range and all the other factors we've talked about before, like position and risk premium. So against that range, you can see that ace jack off is now just going to be a fold. I think there's a tiny bit of calling. You might just be able to see it in there. But honestly, I would just fold in this spot. And instead, we are going to be going with hands like tens plus, suited wheel aces, pocket fours, ace queen off, ace ten suited, etc. So you might be looking at this and thinking, okay, so why does fours get to jam but nines doesn't? And this is what I talk about next in the book. And rather than tell you why, I'm going to encourage you to buy the book because you're going to get all the answers in there and much, much more. Something that encompasses the whole book is logical thought process. And I always encourage you to try to work out why the solver is doing what it's doing. So why does fours jam and nines doesn't? Why does ace five suited jam and yet yeah, ace nine suited doesn't? Why does king jack suited jam but king queen off doesn't? You know, things like that. If you can work those out, then you can work that into your game. So for example, I'll give you a little bit of a spoiler from the book. If we three bet jam pocket nines, it's very unlikely that the cutoff who's opening a tight range anyway is going to fold a better hand. Whereas if we shove pocket fours, they might fold fives and sixes in this example. If we shove ace two suited, they might fold ace jack off, ace ten off, you know, some better ace x hands. If we shove king jack suited, we can get some ace x hands to fold, we can get some pairs to fold, stuff like that. So whilst I did want to encourage you to buy the book, I just want to give you this for free guys. So this is the cutoff strategy facing a small blind three bet jam. And as you can see, five, sixes, sevens, eights, nines actually raise fold in this spot, as do hands like ace jack off and ace jack suited, king queen suited. So when you think about ace two suited, you can get all of those better ace x hands to fold. If you jam king jack suited, you can get the ace x hands and king queen suited and the pairs to fold. If you jam pocket fours, you can get five, sixes, sevens, eights, and nines to fold. But if you jam pocket nines, well, you're just getting tens to fold a little bit, and in practice, probably, you know, tens isn't going to fold. So it's this sort of idea, understanding like why you're choosing certain hands that I go through in all of the examples in this book. And I think by the time you've finished a book, you're going to have a really good understanding of the logical thought processes that you need to succeed at your next final table. So as I mentioned before, the final chapter of the book is all about continuous improvement. And one of my favorite ways to improve at final table play is to watch whole cards up footage on YouTube. And you can see here, I've given uh, some pros and cons of this method. So the pros, you know, you can see how the best players in the world approach final tables. I think that's really useful, especially if you watch some really high stakes final tables, say from scoop or w coop, something like that. You can find spots to run, you can see all cards up, and you get to learn individual player tendencies over time. But the cons, you might assume that well-known pros are playing the hand correctly when in fact they're getting it wrong. Yes, that might be hard to believe, but even the best players in the world, they're not robots. They might be misapplying concepts uh, on these really, really big final tables. Uh, and then the other cons, you don't know individual player tendencies. So you might look at a spot and think, that they're playing it incorrectly, but actually against the particular player they're playing against, it's the right way to play it. So I've included a lot of other examples about how to improve, not just watching whole cards up footage, but I do think that one is really, really good. Uh, you can also watch things like Triton uh, and really high stakes to find out how the top pros are approaching these final tables. Now you might be thinking, but the players I play against are not playing the Triton 100K, 500K, 300K, whatever the buy-in is. 
Well, the thing is that you can find final tables from, I believe you can find something like the Sunday Storm, or you could do, say, a Scoop 109 final table. That's going to play a lot softer, and there are going to be a lot more mistakes in that compared to, say, the Scoop 10K uh, main event. So there's lots of opportunities on YouTube to find some really good whole cards up footage. I definitely recommend doing that and then running your own sims and probably then getting together with a study partner or a group and going through some of the hands to see what you can learn. Now, if you followed my content for a while, you'll know for sure that I love solvers and I love working out why they're doing what they're doing. But I couldn't produce this book without including a section on adjusting for weaker players. It's not a very long section because a lot of the focus is on the solver solutions and what we can learn from the solver solutions. But I wanted to include this because, let's face it, the lower stakes you play, the weaker the players are and they're gonna be making some pretty big mistakes when it comes to ICM. So if you can work out the mistakes that they're making, then you can adjust for that. And that's what this section of the book is all about. And I also wanted to include this section on PKO final tables because there's so much going on with PKOs. A lot of the sites are introducing PKOs as the sort of main tournaments that are available on, on their site. There are a lot more PKOs than or bounty tournaments than the sort of regular vanilla tournaments now so it's important to know what happens on the pko final tables and how the strategy changes so i've included some examples here from pko final tables and i want to show you the differences between what happens on a pko final table compared to what happens on a vanilla final table so that's included in the book as well and just to round out this sort of sneak peek into the book, there is a section on some things the solver won't tell you. And as an example there, keeping the short stack alive. So if you're the player in the big blind with 50 big blinds and there's a player on three big blinds or five big blinds, eight big blinds, something like that. And there are say two other players with a medium stack. It's much better to keep the cutoff alive than the cutoff to bust and then uh, suddenly the risk premiums will drop for the button and the small blind against you as the big stack. So if you can keep the cutoff in there, the button and small blind's risk premium is gonna stay quite high. And that means that they won't get to open as wide and they won't get to defend as wide when you open and they won't get to call as wide when you jam. So lots of good things can happen. This is something then that the solver won't tell you. And there are a few other things in there that they won't tell you as well. But for that, you are going to have to buy the book. And I mean it this time, no spoilers from me. So that's it for the sneak peek of my brand new book, The Final Table, Play Your Best Poker When the Most Is At Stake. I really hope you pick it up. If you do, drop a comment below this video and tell me what you think. I really, really hope you love it. I think you will, but let me know anyway in the comment section. And also check the description for the links on how to buy the book. So that's it. My name is Gareth James, the author of the brand new book, The Final Table. I'll speak to you soon, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.